Let's go for it. Okay. I'm pressing live now. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. Our guest today is Shawnee Major. Shawnee, are you ready to be great today? I am ready to be great. Thank you, Jason. Shawnee Major is the founder of world to click a New York-based fintech startup, and she was previously at a fintech startup where she was employee number six. Shawnee, thanks for being here today. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. So, Shawnee, um, going back in the day a little bit, you spent, I think, 11 years at IBM. Can you talk about some lessons learned there and how that, you know, working as, you know, like a, one of the biggest corporations in the, in the world, you know, like helped you become an entrepreneur? Yeah, sure. So I have to have a little bit of a confession here. One of LinkedIn's AI fails is that they picked up the company name, which I, that I worked for for 11 years called Tobe International. And they streamed in, they extracted the IBM logo. So although I worked at a company, TOV, which has three letters, international, I did not work at IBM. And as much as I would like to change that, I don't have control of that. Apparently there's some AI ML mix up going on on LinkedIn. And um, yeah, so did not work at IBM. However, I did have an amazing experience working at a company called Tobe International, where I did learn a lot about entrepreneurship. And if I'm completely frank, possibly more than I might have learned that at working IBM. And the reason why I say that is because this company that I worked for was extremely lean, small, yet international. So I had the opportunity to experience that international, multinational relationship building, as well as uh, working with people from different cultures, different backgrounds, and an amazing, amazing leadership team that I had close relationship with. And I really do think the foundation of entrepreneurship started there. So man, that's crazy how LinkedIn is like this multi-billion dollar company. And like, I always like, you know, off subject, always like I said, like, I love LinkedIn, I hate LinkedIn, right? I love it because like me and you kind of connected over it, but I hate it because like stuff like that, right? Like, are you kidding me? Like, you, you can't fix this? Like, <sighs> No, I can't fix that. And yeah, I, the company name is correct. It's just the logo that's associated with it is incorrect, which makes you wonder how quickly we make decisions that what we see something that we're familiar with, we just decide that's what it is. Um, but yes, so LinkedIn, LinkedIn is very powerful. It's probably the most powerful professional networking tool there is. Is it perfect? No. It, is it potential for disruption? Absolutely. But like you said, we met because of it. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. But I mean, just for assuming like you were like, you know, you actually look for a job, right? And, and you apply to company and then someone looks at your LinkedIn profile also, and, and they, they might say yes or no, just because of IBM, right? A hundred percent. No, hundred percent. Now that you think of it, a hundred percent. People might detract from my experience having spent so much time at IBM. Um, so, you no, know, maybe I should circle back with LinkedIn and see what I can do. So next, can you talk talk about your time? I believe it's called FF Venture Capital. Yeah, that was an amazing experience. I, I, I think when I talk about an amazing experience working somewhere, it's really 99% about the people there. And I was super fortunate to work with an amazing team at FFVC. And initially I was brought into FFVC, FF Venture Capital, which is a small early stage uh, VC fund based in New York. And they make investments in early stage tech startups uh, with a focus on deep tech, so cyber, AI, ML, but also generalists. So you know, meal kits, strong technology, credit card processing. And working there meant that in a very short amount of time, I got a very big exposure to a lot of different startups in a lot of different stages. It's, it, it's as much as you could possibly get you know, throwing in the deep end in the startup ecosystem. And what I learned working with these people is that there's so much innovation out there. There's so much collaboration, there's so much technology, there's so much opportunity to disrupt the legacy industries that are there today. And I knew that this startup ecosystem, regardless of where I go, is someplace that I wanted to stay. 
Uh, the people were amazing. Just you know, working from the founders to the investors to everybody else in between. I, I'm very fortunate to have met so many awesome people that I'm still in touch with today. Yeah, it's crazy how like how many exciting people work on exciting things, isn't it? It no, it really is. And I feel like we've only just begun. There's a lot of focus on innovation in certain areas, but we haven't scratched the surface in so many different areas. And I, I think of things, you know, I guess my mind can't shut off even if I wanted to, but I, I think of things like, you know, why isn't this built? Why can't we have this? Uh, why is it so complicated? Why don't we have, uh, and I think COVID accelerated that way of thinking. And, you know, like certain things like, this is a, a pet peeve of mine. I want that there should exist an airline dedicated for, let's call it senior year, for the people who are traveling, but their needs are very different than the different uh, demographics. Why can't there be an airline that goes twice a day to Florida, twice a day to West Coast, that specifically caters to a population that are aging? And they need that perhaps the meals and the snacks are catered. They're not the high sodium taro chips. Um, perhaps there's somebody there that can help with the luggage. Perhaps the gates, this blows my mind. The gates are not 5,000 miles away from security, uh, honestly. So, but these are the type of things that I think about. And I really think that we really have a lot more to do. There's a lot done. Yes, it's super cool that we could put a helicopter on Mars. Yay. Um, but we have so, so, so much more to do. And I'm excited to be part of it. Yeah, there's so many problems to solve. Um, we'll, we'll talk about you coming in more detail in a little bit, but are you, are you fundraising? Or are you just going to totally bootstrap your company? So bootstrap to date. Yeah. Bootstrap to date. And I think, you know, founders vacillate between bootstrapping all the way through, which some have managed to do that, and then taking that, you know, that VC funding because of the signaling or for whatever reasons they think that they require it. It's a tough call, it's a tough call. Um, and I think that there's pros and cons to doing both. I admire and respect any founder, whatever their decisions they decide to do. They made the best decision that they could at that time to take funding, not to take funding, how much to take from whom and for what did they give away for it and to keep chugging along. Really, so, right? If you do decide to fundraise, do you think your experience that a VC firm is going to help you or hurt you? Is it going to help you because you like you know the back end stuff, how it works, or is it going to hurt you because like you actually know how it works? I think that's one of those things where you don't really know who you will be until you're in that situation. One of uh, one of the first classes I took it was actually an FIT, at the National Institute of Technology, and it was a class on introduction to entrepreneurship, and it's actually a funny story how I got to taking that class. I was traveling, like I said, for quite some time. And I knew that for the next three, four months, I would not be traveling anywhere. And I was living in Manhattan at that time. And the apartment that I was living in would constantly get these flyers from FIT. You know, uh, continuing professional education, more classes, more classes, more classes. And I knew for the first time in a very long time that I could actually attend a class. But when I opened up the brochure, there were so many interesting classes, I didn't know where to begin. So I closed, I took the brochure, closed it, closed my eyes. Oh, put my finger in one of the pages and then put my finger on one of the, oh, somewhere on the page. And then I opened my eyes and I, that's the class I enrolled in. And that class was not the entrepreneurship class. That class was a class called uh, Luxury Marketing for Global Brands. I don't know what I was going in for, but I figured why not, we'll, we'll take a shot. And during that class, the professor there, he was the Dean of the Entrepreneurship Division. And he told me, you need to take this class, um, beginning entrepreneurship for beginners. And this professor who taught that class, he said, he asked the class, what would you do? You were working on a startup for um, two years. You have an offer to sell a company for $5 million. What do you do? 
And all the students raised their hands, they gave answers, they gave explanations. And he gave an answer to the class, which I thought was very wise. You don't know. Until somebody is literally sitting there with a check, ready to hand over $5 million, you have no idea what your answer will be. And going back to your question about fundraising, you don't know. Until someone's literally there saying, hey, we will give you an investment of X for Y, it's really hard to know what you'll do. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, that's a great point. Like with the $5 million, I mean, $5 million might seem like a lot of money, but it really isn't, right? P depending on how long you've been on there, like how much you have to give up to, you know, different people working for you because equity and stuff like that. And that's a tough question. Yeah. Exactly. And then with the VC, you know, it, you know, investments, and I, you know, it's this stereotype, you know, you know, you know, someone's going to invest X amount of money for X amount of profit and all this kind of stuff. But I'm not sure the numbers wrong, but I think the numbers for only 1% of companies even get VC investment. And obviously that's not even an uh, indicator you're going to succeed, right? Like the most famous example recently was I think Quibi had like $500 million in investments and like they went belly up like in less than a year. Why is it this myth or stereotype like, you know, fundraising, fundraising VC versus like the bootstrapping method? I suspect that there's a bit of emotions attached to that decision. So that in, you may, the founders may make a decision that's not necessarily the most wisest monetarily, but maybe more emotional. That's what their friends are doing. That's what they're seeing as a signal for success. That's who they can brag about at the next, whatever, football game. And so there may be actual reasons why VC funding is helpful, but not necessarily for everyone in all cases at all times. One of the advantages that VC funding might help is that depending on the investors, they could be supportive in, uh, in fundraising for the next round. They could be supportive in recruiting. They have a network that most founders can't, don't have, and they can access those investors network. They can help with just the knowledge and expertise that they have having invested in companies that have been through these stages before. So there is a potential to a big upside, given that the investors can, it, it, assuming that the investors consider themselves a real legitimate partner in the business. The other advantage is that sometimes the model of the startup really is suitable for that fast pace, for that hyper growth. Um, and that typically may not happen organically by bootstrapping. And uh, if you want to you know, land and expand in a specific vertical or a specific whatever is hot right now that you're building in, that might not be funded by the small incremental revenue growth that you'll see without that VC funding. So I certainly see a space for it, but it doesn't mean it's for everyone or for every type of startup or with every investor. Shani, so, so you actually uh, share an a, a angel list, a VC list that you, you share with people. Can you tell me how you, where that list came from, but just researching your own like connections and, 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 and for first of all, and, you know, thank you for sharing that with me. That's a great re resource, but how did that come about? I have you have you heard of the book by Adam Grant, Give and Take? No, I haven't. It's a fantastic book. Adam Grant is an awesome writer. He wrote a Plan B, um, and he. The premise of this book, Give and Take, is that leveraged wisely, giving can be lead to success. Now, give too much, you overuse yourself, you overexpose yourself and you just, you just burn out. Being only a taker, it's not the most powerful way to succeed. Matching, which is, Jason, you give me, I give you, you give me, I give you, also not the, most, the best way to success. But giving and giving smartly is a potentially really powerful tool that leaders leverage in order to succeed. And I didn't know that this concept existed when I read the book, but it speaks very closely to me. By nature, I like to give. If you need something that I have, why shouldn't I share it with you? If, you have, if I have information 
that I can provide that will help you move faster, not make mistakes that I have made, why not share it? And this list is just an example of it. Um, this list is, I think is managed, it's called the Active Investor List. It's managed by Trace Cohn, who is an investor, I think it's New York Venture Partners, and he's managing this list. So Sonny, one thing I've had to learn is how to you know, learn how to say no. How have you learned to say no more often? To no, save your time, like all that kind of stuff. That's a good question. And I think another principle from another book, it might be seven habits. It might, it might be seven habits is, am I the best person to do this? Am I the only person that can do this? And if the answer is no, then perhaps someone else should be doing this. Now, I'm not talking about in personal life, you know, with family, with children, with parents, putting that aside. But perhaps there's somebody who's better able to provide the answer to this or to connect with that person. Or, uh, and I should be putting my time and effort into things that only I can be as much, the most useful as possible. It's hard to do. So saying no, sometimes we, you know, it's a spectrum. Sometimes we say no too much. Sometimes we don't say no enough. Sometimes we feel in the groove and we're in that balance. But it's, it's, a, pro it's a process. And we probably don't get it right all the time. But I do think about that. I do think about, am I the only person that can do this? Am I the best person? Or is there someone else that can be doing this right now? And I can use my skills, my knowledge, my expertise, my time in a better way. I, I don't know if there's a perfect answer. So Sonny, how do you deal with this? Like suppose you give something to uh, uh, someone like six, seven times, you keep on giving value, like nothing big, something like something, you know, minor, you give a list of your stuff seven, eight times, and then you need something from this person, right? And you ask them for something and you know, they can do it for you. But they tell you, no, do you like stop giving them stuff. You just say, no, well, maybe they had a bad day. I just keep on giving them value. How do you deal with that? So I think it goes back to the why and what you're giving in the first place. So it sounds like what you're talking about there is the matching principle, where I give you in order so that at some point or another, when I need something, you will give me. So we're matching each other. And that, that's okay, because for some people without that, they wouldn't give anybody anything. But I think for some people, the giving is without the expectation. Somebody said a quote to me that, I'm repeating like I know as on the last couple of weeks because I just love it. Expectations is a contract that nobody signed. That's mind, a good quote. Mind blown. Mind blown. Expectations is a contract that nobody signed. And now that I think about that, it's like I my expectations are that if I give you a birthday gift, you will give me a birthday gift. We never agreed on that. <laughs> We never agreed on that. Like, I'm, I'm just going through. This is a great example. My, your expectations are that if I give you a birthday gift, a, 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 a baby present for your first child, I will give you a baby present for your second child. Why? Who said? So now there's that bit of resentment because you expected me to give you a baby present. We never had that deal. I never committed to that. So once you remove the expectations of what you think you're going to have, what you think is coming to you or is due to you, whatever that means, then you reduce that anger, that resentment, that bitterness. Now, the next time that, some, that same person asks you for something, it's a clean slate. I, I decide yes, I decide no, but it has nothing to do with that historical experience before because there was no expectations. I, I think it's hard. I think it's hard. And I think sometimes we do better at it than others. And I think from some people, we have more expectations than we, we do from others. You know, a stranger, less, a parent, more. But I don't know. I think by removing that expectation out of the, out of the uh, picture, I don't give you control of my happiness. I control when I'm happy. If I expect you to do something for me, then my happiness or sadness is in your hands. Why would I do that? Why would I let you, Jason, 
control whether or not I have a good day or a bad day. I don't want to do that. I, does that make sense? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And cause I, have, I, have a, I have a friend. Um, and sometimes you do, I think you put on, like a, a burden on your friends that, you know, that I'm not looking to have. Like I have a friend has a birthday coming up and someone I sent him like a $250 bottle of bourbon, like expensive bottle of bourbon, $250. Now like, is this person expect me that's like the same price gift for his birthday? Like, you know, like do I have to give this back? So all that, that kind of stuff too. It gets complicated. Yes. Um, so, you know, as an entrepreneur, we got all kinds of advice. You know, most of it is like, you know, from a good, good place of intent, you know, good heart. But, but how do you like cipher through all the advice you get? I think one way to be scientific about it, if you will, is to actually track what the comments were. Um, I don't know if you can tell Jason, whenever I get a question, I tend to go back a few steps before I answer it. So if I get distracted, let me know. But in this case, so, you know, YouTube, super powerful. And I was watching some sort of like a, a music video and then a commercial came on and it was a commercial for Tony Robbins. And he stopped, you know, usually I skip the ad, skip ad, skip it, but I was distracted. So I actually heard his entire commercial. And his ad, in his ad, he mentioned something extremely interesting. He mentioned, sometimes our friends and the people we, we care about don't give us good advice. And sometimes the people that we don't like, we can actually hate them. They give us good advice. Yeah, that is very, very true. And I was like, whoa, hold on a second. And then what that meant was that even if someone that I don't have a good relationship with, I don't like them. Um, there's something that I can glean I can extract from that exchange that could be useful. And I think that's one way to think about investors knows. Now, to be completely honest, 99% of my interactions with investors have been really exemplar, really awesome people, professionals, sophisticated, knowledgeable, responsive. I think maybe one or two outliers, but really on the whole, they know their business and talking to founders is their business and only awesome experiences, almost only awesome experiences. So when you get the no and you get explanation why, track it. Is that the first person to say that? Is that the fifth person? Even if it hurts that no, there may be something worthwhile listening to. And the more you talk to them and the more no's you get, and if possible, they give you feedback why, it could be just a, a cheap way for you to learn where there's room, room for improvements. So when you can, like I can take the emotion out of the experience, then I can extract some teachings. Yeah, that's a great point. I think a lot of people get emotional, too emotional involved, right? Like what do you say, don't mix, mix business with personal? I mean, you can't mix your emotions, right? We're human. And, and, you know, and that's a good point. Like I, I said this a couple of times before, like you go somewhere with feedback and they like, they'll say like, they trash your idea. That's not going to work. They say, I well, don't take it personal. Like you said, we're human. It's kind of hard to think to yourself. Okay. I've been working this for a year and a half and you just say it's horrible. Right? Like how, how do you not take it personal? But you have to, you know, sort of way, right. Or this, or let's push it aside and then and move on. So I had an experience with a, not an investor, a founder. And his critique of the app was super harsh, like unnecessarily brutal. It was obnoxious. It was like, this is, a, I'm almost a exact quote, this is a piece of crap, this is ugly, I wouldn't show it, I wouldn't share it, no, 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 et cetera, et cetera. Jason, if I'm honest with you, for the next 48 hours, I was, I was in a fog. I was in a fog. At the end of the 48 hours, I was like, Maybe I should get new designers. Maybe I should design the screens. Maybe I should you know, take you off uh, the, the, um, the app store for now. Thinking all this devastation because of one person's very harsh criticism. And then the fog lifted. And I said, okay, that's where emotions were in and out and logic starts coming in. Okay. Let's see if he's right. Let's see if he's right. It's possible that he's right. It's also possible that he's wrong. Let's check. 
And then what I did was for a couple of hundred dollars, I put out a survey out there in the world using polefish and I tested for the hypothesis whether or not the market preferred design improvements or the original. And the result was on the things that I was looking for, the market liked the designs as they were. Of course, there's always room for improvement. But what I learned from this was with time, accept and then test and then learn. And I think that just uh, was like a very interesting experience for me because I fell into the exact same funk that you were talking about for two days. And then as founders, we got to get out of it. That's a very good point. Yeah. And then, you know, you don't know if like he actually thought he was doing your service by being so hard or was he coming from a bad place or was he just having a bad day? You just, you just never know. Right. So you got to take, take that point of view too, I think. Exactly. And it could be his personality. Like maybe that's the way he talks to people and that's the way people talk to him. So this was normal talking. I don't know. I don't need to care, but I need to know if what about the experience I can learn something from. Shani, so what drives you? <laughs> Insanity. Um, <laughs> this absolutely, it, you know, I'm not sure if you caught uh, Elon Musk on SNL. Yeah, I did. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure who did it. Yeah, um, that was must watch TV. Right? Seriously. Um, there's a certain passion that comes from being a founder from in a, in a few different ways. One is just the idea of building something. The second is the idea of solving a problem. And the third might be for a lot of people, you know, the, the potential financial gains. What I tell people is, if you want to make a lot of money, get a job that makes a lot of money. If you want to make more money, get a job that pays you more money. But if you really want to be a founder, I think it needs to be more than just about the money. It has to be about the, uh, the ability to build something, innovate, collaborate, and to solve a problem that you think is really important. So Shani, if there's one characteristic that you have that you wish you'd be better at or have more of, like me, I, I'm horrible at patience, right? I, I wish I could be a more patient person. What's the characteristic you wish you could, you could get better at? Well, we can spend the whole hour just talking about that. Um, I, I think that I think it's really important to develop a network. I think that never ends, never ends. I think leadership skills that come with being in a founder position, you need to draw on them more and more. And I would really, really want to improve on that. I think we never stop learning. Never, never stop learning. Not as a startup, not as a founder, not as a person, never stop learning. So I think that continuously learning, continuously improving, me specifically, leadership. I think sometimes in life, we go through experiences where we learn a lot of what not to do. No, yeah, that's a whole other hour. But <laughs> uh, learning what to do and how to do, I think sometimes we're fortunate to have experiences where we're working with people who teach that. But it's not the same thing as doing it. And I think that is an area where I will always, always need to continuously work on. Yeah, I, I think I think one thing a lot of people mess up on just this leaders in general, people in leadership positions, like just because this leadership method worked with this person doesn't mean it's gonna work with the other person, right? You gotta like learn and mix it up, so to speak, right? One one size that definitely not fit all. Exactly, exactly. And sometimes what worked with one company will work with the other. If you worked, I'm saying, in a in an Amazon, and now you're working at Ethan Allen, it's potentially two different cultures. I can't say for certain. I don't know, but it's potentially two different cultures and the ability to adapt and to adjust. These are core, core, core requirements for leadership. But I answered the question. What about you, Jason? Uh, patience. Patience, yes, patience, yeah. Example I use like, you know, Starbucks and Amazon here in Seattle. If you switch companies, you better not use the same method going from one company to the other one for Starbucks, Amazon. They have two completely different cultures. So 
I will tell you something since you mentioned Starbucks and patients. My name is Shami. When I go to Starbucks and I order a coffee, I tell the barista that my name is Sue. <laughs> the reason for it is, I, is it because I'm guessing they, they will know how to write that name. They're not going to ask me. Oh. And then Sue is a, a three letter name. So in my mind, I'm thinking to myself, if each of us would tell the barista a three letter name or even shorter, a two letter name, how much faster globally would the line move? You're right. I never thought about it like that. <laughs> so you talk about patience. Like I'm, I'm, I'm impatient enough that I'm shortening my name. <laughs> and that's why I'm changing my name in order to, just to get through the process faster. So I totally get with you on the patience thing. So I mean, next talk about being a female entrepreneur, like, has it been a blessing? Has it made it harder, easier, have more networks open up because you're a female? Like, can you talk about that process? Uh, you know, the statistics on, on startup founding and you know, the statistics on startup founding for female founders. It's, it's dismal. Yes. It's, very dismal. It, it really is. I think there's a lot of work that needs to get done. There's a lot of work that needs to get done. And we're only just starting on this journey. I think an awareness is a starting point. I think an awareness and execution on that awareness, continuous execution on that awareness that this is a problem is required. And sometimes, you know, after an, an experience, the world will get really passionate about a cause and for the next three, six months, you know, your PR and marketing people will splash out how this company and that investor and this uh, corporate conglomerate is doing something different. I think we need to see more of that for longer and, and to make sure whatever it is that they're doing is really impactful. For me personally, a first time female founder in FinTech who's non-technical, yeah. It's a challenge. It certainly is a challenge. I think that from the onset, people told me, you should do this as a hobby. You should do this as a hobby. And I wondered, like, after I got that reaction, would you see that to a male founder? I don't know. Um, somebody else told me, you'll never get started founding. You'll never get investors to buy into your startup. Not, nothing personal, he said. It's just the nature of things. You'll never get an investor. Like, would that be different if I look different? I don't know. And, I, and I, it, it breaks my heart to see so many female founders going after dreams and seeing the challenges that they have one after the other after the other. Um, so kudos to all those who are working to change that and kudos to all the female founders who are charging ahead regardless. So I have to assume that when you're like doing your networking and you know, all the founder stuff that often you're probably like either the only female in the room or one of the few females in the room. How do you deal with that dynamic? Yeah, it's a challenge. <laughs> no, it, it, it certainly is a challenge. Uh, I think that Confidence and courage and continuously working on that is my solution. Confidence that I belong in the room, courage to stay there as long as I can, and just really the ability to look back and say, I need to be here. This is important enough to be here. And also the ability to forgive yourself when you can't. Sometimes it's just too much. Sometimes it's just too hard. Sometimes being the only, whatever that only is, it's just not today. Maybe I need to retreat in order to come back another time. And that's okay too. When very, maybe this is a experience thing, but what it took me a, a long time to realize is that I might be the only in that room, the only female founder in that room, but the anxiety that I feel might not be any different than the person right next to me, whether or not there's a hundred of other people that look just like him. Anxiety is, 
is not specific. There's certain things that can might make it more, spe more specific or harder for other people. But I don't know that necessarily being the only means that I'm the only person feeling, hey, this is uncomfortable, this is challenging. There's a lot of people that don't want to be there. They'd rather hide in the bathroom. No, seriously, they'd rather hide in the bathroom. They are looking for a way out. They're hiding in the corner of the room. They're, um, it, yeah, this networking thing is really hard. It's really hard. There's ways to de-risk that challenge, you know, like public speaking, going with a friend, um, and maybe minimizing the time that you're there, knowing that someone else will be there. But it doesn't mean it's not hard for everybody. I think there's a lot of people that really find networking a challenge. And what that does for me, Jason, when I see it from that lens, then when I go over and talk to somebody, I'm actually doing them a favor. I'm doing an act of charity, an act of kindness, because they're just as miserable as I am, if not 10 times more. So why not put somebody out of their misery, misery and say, hi, I'm Shani Major. How are you doing? How's it going? That's why? Nice point. Yeah. Yeah, one thing I do, like, like I'm an introvert, introvert. So, like, if, if something starts at 7 p.m., I get to 7.15, it's a waste of my time because I'm not going to talk to anyone. I'm not going to interrupt anyone. So what I do, I'll get to, like, 10 minutes beforehand and, and, and talk to people as they walk through the door. So that's my, like, some of my networking trick that I do. That's a great one, and I might copy it. <laughs> right, and, but you see, what you did was you found what doesn't work for you. Mm -hmm. You found what works for you, and you're leveraging it, but it is in that way. And I, I don't say I'm an extrovert by any stretch of the imagination. I'm a total introvert. But I think for me, what worked is knowing that I can be generous with my and kind with my ability to talk to strangers. It's a way that I can share and reduce someone else's pain and uncomfortableness. And that I can do. Yes. So back to VCs for a minute. And this is like speaking generalities and it's like a pet peeve of mine, but you have like investors or whatever they may be. And they'll say like, we want to like invest in diverse people, right? But then the next sentence they'll say, well, you have to know us, you have to get an a, a introduction to us, or we have to invest in you before. Like, it doesn't make sense. Like, you know, how is someone going to find you new? I just, I never understood that concept, right? I'll tell you one way to think about it is flip the scenario for yourself for a second. Let's say you're an investor. It's five o'clock on a Thursday. You have an hour before you're supposed to meet your significant other. Friday morning at 9 a.m. is the investor meeting where all the investors are going to get together and you need to present three startups to that meeting. So the first thing I say is to startups, make sure that when your slides, your presentation, your deck gets into that inbox, and that investor needs to go through 300 of them that came in that week, yours will stick out. That's it, that's, that's the easy thing, right? Make sure that you, when he has to come out of three out of 300, that there might be the best possible chance that he'll pick yours. That she is like rushing through it and is gonna see something that catches her eye and is gonna pull yours out of the 300 emails that she got that week. The second thing I can think about is when those 300 emails came in, which one is she or he more likely to look at? The ones that came in from a cold email, the info at abcvc.com, or the one that came in from, hey, you know, Jane, uh, Shani is an awesome person and you should check us out. So I'm not saying that this is you know, fear or correct, but what I'm saying is that is the potentially the lens in which that VC in that chair is looking through those 300 emails. So why I say that is I'm a little kinder when I understand it from that perspective. Yeah. Does that help me get in the door? Not necessarily, but I'm a little kinder. I'm not angry. I don't resent it. I don't 
I don't, I get it. I totally get it. So what that means is that I, I'm a startup founder, I'm gonna to try to find that Jane who can introduce me to an investor. I can try. Do we have a LinkedIn connection? Do we have a network? Do we have something I can throw into that line of that email that says, hey, investor, I see that you went to such and such school, so did I. Hey, I see that you're from such and such neighborhood, so am I. Something, something. And if I can't, I can't. But I reduce my, my frustration that the process isn't fair because I, I get it. Now on the cold email thing, there are investors that have money that they need to deploy. And reaching out to them cold, it could work. It could totally work. A well-crafted cold email could work. 50% of the time, I'm not sure. 30%, I'm not sure. But 0%, Maybe not, I don't know. And then not every startup is VC backable. It, it, just, it just isn't. They have their requirements, not because the investor themselves has the requirements, that's because that, that's the agreement they wrote up with their investors. Um, and they need to stick within that thesis. That's their knowledge, that's their expertise, that's the return that they're looking for, et cetera. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. And quickly, and can you talk about the process of VCs, how they have to raise funds also? I think a lot of entrepreneurs think all these VCs just have millions of dollars at disposal, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the VCs have to raise funds themselves, right? It's a tough business. It is a hard business. Seriously. I, I think that the, the, the implied power dynamics between the VC and the a founder is just an implication. There's a lot of that that's, um, it, it's just the illusion of power. But VCs are in an interesting situation. They're a marketplace. They're connecting investor dollars to in hopefully investable startups. And they're somewhere in the middle. And they need to raise capital just like founders need to raise capital. Except that it's potentially harder for them because you know, they have a smaller pool of people who could write those checks. I don't know, but it's not easy. And the accounting for it is not easy and fundraising for VCs is not easy. And then deploying that capital is not easy. And what we hear about is how, oh, this uh, is VC invested in, I don't know, let's make it Uber and look what their returns are. But you don't hear about are all the startups that you don't hear about because they're not around anymore. So there is that like, uh, what's it called? That, that, um, not the halo effect, the su survivor bias. Yeah, yeah. Okay. There is a survivor bias. Uh, it's a tough business. They have to go out on their own roadshows to raise capital. And they have, to be, uh, they have to be answerable to those investors, some of whom are tough cookies. They really are. So I think it's tough, yeah. Sonny, Nick, can you talk about the process of launching your app and how you how idea validation played a part in that? I so after I took the entrepreneurship class at FIT, I realized that this entrepreneurship thing was really cool and I wanted to learn more about it. I rather than take a course here and a course here and a course here, I figured out one of the best ways to do that was within the MBA framework. So I went to uh, Brew College, the Zikron School of Business for my MBA. And there, any and every class that I could think of that focused on entrepreneurship and innovation, I attended. So when it comes to like the lean start methodology, I heard it coming out from all different sorts. Uh, you know, the idea being that find the fastest and cheapest way to eliminate the possibility that the idea is not an idea. That recurring theme, you hear over and over and over and over again until just it's coming out of your ears. And outside of the school curriculum, I read up as much of it as possible. Find the fastest and cheapest way to eliminate, not to validate, the possibility that your idea, your baby, is not an idea. And Going through the school 
I threw a couple of ideas that were floating in my head, but this one particular one for Will to Click, I decided to go through that process of finding a fast and cheap way to research whether or not this was an idea. I did surveys. I surveyed people who had wills. I would send out a survey and then get the results, send out another survey, fine tuning the questions again and again. I interviewed uh, trust and state attorneys, wealth advisors. And just for the context, Will to Click is an app available for uh, iOS that lets people aggregate their personal items, the jewelry, the watches, the art, the silver, as part of an estate. So the user can take a picture of their watch, assign it to a beneficiary, mother, brother, sister, aunt, uncle in their contact list, uh, estimate the value, and then save it in the app, as well as notify the, their attorney and or the individual that they're expecting to get this watch. And only after doing multiple surveys with multiple people within the trust and estate um, ecosystem, I started to realize that there's a problem here and there's a problem we're solving. But what really honed it in for me was a personal experience. And after that, I, I didn't know how to build an app. What does this mean to design those things? And yeah, I had no clue. Again, my background is accounting and finance. Um, so somebody suggested that I go to General Assembly and I did a UX bootcamp. UX bootcamp. And there I learned how to design you know, the outlines of apps. And then I built a prototype. And I went around getting feedback. Oh no, I don't understand this button. I don't know how this works. I don't know how that works. And then I built a second prototype. And it was only after going through all these multiple steps, that's when I realized, you know what? There is something worthwhile here. And now it gets to a point where it's going or go. Build, execute, or put it aside. But I did try to do that lean start methodology of validate the business idea, speak to people, do the surveys, build the prototypes, test the prototypes before I'm actually going out and developing the app. That's very impressive you did the boot camp. I, I, I'll give you kudos for that right there. That's very impressive. You know what? I didn't even think about it. Like someone said, I, literally someone suggested this on like a Tuesday. By Wednesday, I had registered. The boot camp was on Sunday. It was one of the smartest things I ever did. So how, how did you connect with your current team? Yeah, part of what happened after I decided that the app was worth building was I went to figure out, okay, so how do I build an app? I, same thing. I was thinking of going to a boot camp to learn how to code. But we talked about this. I didn't think that was the best use of my time. I was never going to code the entire app. So I eliminated that. And, and then I started doing the same thing, talking to people, uh, uh, people, other founders. What was your process like? Um, consulting CTOs, what would it look like to have them, you know, consult in this process? I talked to agencies, dev shops. Eventually, I, I spoke to a founder who exited his app to Adobe, and he referred me to the dev team that I'm working with, and I was very impressed. You talk about, you know, female founders. And the other agencies, the other dev shops, they gave me this, like, templated proposal that was vague, that was not informative at all. It was like a boilerplate. We don't know, it could take 60 hours, it could take 600 hours, I'm exaggerating. It could cost you $50,000, it could cost you $500,000, we don't know. I was like, oh, this is not gonna work at all. Um, this dev team uh, over in Jaipur in India, completely offshore, they really impressed me with the dedication and their commitment to getting this, well, uh, to getting this gig, but also to working on building this project. And that's who I ultimately worked with. So quickly, and um, can you tell them about the story, how you sent them this thank you card and their reaction to it? Oh, you know, the power of LinkedIn, true story, just happened today. Somebody posted on LinkedIn today. If you're working with people in India, just check in with them and see how they're doing. So I just sent a note to one of the people that were on my team, just checking and seeing how you're doing, saying hi. And she replied with a very nice email. 
I think when I go back through my experiences and I look at who really impacted me, it was the people that took that extra step to do the right thing or to show appreciation. And a story that I've shared is that there was this, there, um, there's this elderly gentleman that uh, me and my coworker had a meeting with, really fabulously wealthy individual, very respected, very proper. And we got to the meeting, we had the meeting, we went back, fine. About an hour or two later, somebody came to our office. It was a messenger. My coworker had left his pen in the office. Okay, the pen happened to be a little bit valuable, I know, because I, I got it for him. But the thought and the consideration to return a pen to people like, you know, they could have just sent an email saying, oh, we have your pen, come back and get it. They could have not said anything and then my co would have lost his pen. Um, but that thought and consideration to take the time to send somebody to return a pen, these are the small things that impact a person and change the way we see relationships and respect and consideration. And that letter that, so what happened was um, after the app initially launched, this just to share, I, I sent a thank you letter to India, to this team. And it was a, uh, uh, whatever, something, a card that I had in a box. I had to go get a stamp. I wrote a short note. I sent it to India thinking, I don't know, it will get there, it won't get there. Around six weeks later, uh, the director called me up on the phone that he had the dev team in his office in the conference room and he was reading the letter out loud. And the team there, you know, they had all worked really hard, nine and a half hours away. I don't even know if I spoke to all of them. There were tears, there, some of them were crying because it was really impactful that somebody had taken the time and effort just to show that minor, minor, minor act of appreciation. And I just think that the world would just be a lot better place if we did more of those things. Yeah, people don't realize how impactful those little things are. Exactly. Exactly. Look, I, I'm telling you this story, you know, about this pen that happened, I don't, how many years ago? Because it, it affected me. It just, it, sometimes we have the opportunity to be, get exposure to someone or something that raises the bar for what we know we can do or who we can be a little bit. And you can't unlearn that. No, you cannot. Roshani, as a non-tech founder, how do you go about like giving, like, giving imp input on the, on the product roadmap? Like it's something you do by yourself? Is a give and take to you and the dev team? Like how do you, as a non-tech founder, how do you work through the product roadmap? Yeah. So what I didn't tell you about this development part was that in order for me to be comfortable giving guidance and advice and my input, I read three books on app development, how to build an app, not the coding part of it, not the engineering side of it, but how to manage the building of an app so that I was familiar with what needed to get done and how this process was managed. Obviously it was my first time. So a lot of learning, a lot of experience. I think what, is key for me, from my perspective, is the humility to know that you don't know. I don't know how to build an app. I think I might have learned something, but I really don't know. And then leveraging the knowledge and expertise of a team, that this is what they do. Jason, if you came to me and said, oh, this is how you should do accounting, I would look at you and say, uh-huh, sure. <laughs> It will take you many, 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 many years. And I'm not saying this out of arrogance. It will take you many, many, many years if you're not an accountant for you to catch up to what I know. When you're building a startup, you don't have those many, many years. So have the humility to know that you don't know everything and loop in the team with the knowledge and expertise and the experience that does and leverage their perspective, their opinions. And I think that collaboration is really vital.
for this reason, because you don't have the time to and the time and the money to make those mistakes. Uh, so when I think about the product model map, again, it goes back to lean. Is this something that we need to build? What will it take? How long will it take? Including debugging and the design, et cetera. And then how do we know that this is something that we need? Is this priority one, priority five, priority three? Is there a way that we could test this before? A simple survey. Let, let's spend $300 on a survey to put out to our target market and ask them uh, in the way that makes sense. Uh, we're thinking of building this feature. What, what, is your, what is the likelihood that you use it? Depending on how the question is asked, if you get all zeros, why build something because my ego says it should be built? It's not helpful. What, what is the ultimate goal? The ultimate goal is to build a product for enough people that you can monetize at a rate that you can be profitable. That's a great not, definition. Thank you. Not to build something Shiny Major wants because Shiny Major wants it. I don't know. Then build a spaceship. I mean, I don't know what to say. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Uh, yeah. So, Sean, you talked about this a little bit before, but what, can you talk about the courage someone needs to start a company? A ridiculous amount of courage. And no matter how much courage you have, you're going to need more. And there'll be times that you'll have more of it, and there'll be times that you have less of it. But uh, I think, again, when you see that room of people who look like that they have courage, that look like they have confidence, I hope that some people also realize that they're full of it. They are completely bluffing it. They are pretending just as much as you are, maybe better, maybe less. And maybe some of them don't have to bluff, but there is a good portion of the people in that room that are scared as shit and they are just powering through it. And some people, do a better job of hiding it. And some people lie to themselves and some people lie to their team, their co-founders. But for the most part, people are running as hard as they can, but it takes a lot of courage to continue to do that. So next, let's talk about your company in more detail, like how and why you got started, what, what's going on with it right now and what's your vision for it in the future? Yeah, so I think when we talked about problem or solving, for me, I had grown up around stories that, you know, this one is fighting with his brother. These two cousins don't talk. These two grandparents got into a fight. These are all true. Um, and two generations later, there's this, still this fight, this resentment, this anger. And so many times it comes from these personal items that these cousins were fighting over, the brothers were fighting over. Dad told me I could have a stamp collection. No, he told me I can have a stamp collection. Um, I want grandma's pearls. Well, you got her ring. I want the pearls, et cetera, et cetera. And all these stories did not really compute to me. I couldn't relate to it. I could not imagine fighting over stuff until I could see in my own family that happened. And the story I tell about this tea set that my mother asked me if I could have, if I wanted. And I said, yes. But it turns out she was talking about a different tea set. As luck would have it, my mother has three tea sets. So she was referring to one. I was thinking the other. The third one, none of us were mentioning. And then I realized there was like this, this panic a little bit. Like, oh, we could be those people. We could be those people that fight over stuff. And I'm like, oh yeah, this is ridiculous. There's gotta be a better solution for this. There's gotta be a way to solve this today. Um, and that was when I started doing the research because I realized that for me, family and relationships are important. And I wanted to do something that would engender the con continuity of family peace for generations. And that's when I realized that Walter Click was a problem of solving. And, and what's your plan for for the future? Sure. So these personal items, while they're emotionally very valuable, 
that tea set, the watch, the ring, etc. cetera. And as part of our feedback from doing surveys, somebody said, I don't want my daughter-in-law to touch one piece of my jewelry. Like that was her answer. I don't want my son-in-law to get his hands on any of my stuff. Um, so but emotionally extremely valuable, but not necessarily intrinsically valuable as part of an entire estate. Mm. Unless your art is like Chagall, Van Gogh, Monet, then these personal items don't necessarily make up the bulk of the estate. So the future features of Walter Click would be to aggregate the life insurance policies, the real estate, the personal items, investment accounts, bank accounts, so that the user has a real view of the entire estate and the beneficiary allocation. So they can know today what they have and where it's going. And by knowing that, they can better plan their wealth, prepare for their loved ones, and protect it. Taxes, et cetera, insurance. So how do you work through this? And hopefully I don't ask this question too messed up, but like in general, it's like, you know, you know we're like upper income, middle income, people like have wills, all that kind of stuff. And below income people really, really don't. How, how are you going to influence the low income people to use your app? Like, you know, cause you know, they have tea sets and stuff too. Like, how are you going to work through that? So I think that that's the crazy thing about this is that everybody has stuff that is important to them. It's not necessarily the value of the stuff. It's really just stuff. Um, you know, the tea set, it could be worth $30. It could be $3,000, but for some people, it's important for them to know who's getting it and what they're expecting to receive. So I think if you're an ultra high net worth individual, somebody you know, with a family office, a state manager, this is not for you. But for everybody else, I think it's just a question of a persona. I wanna do the right thing. I wanna take care of the stuff so that my family doesn't fight over things when I'm no longer here. Um, and it's kind of like, you take care of them now, you want to take care of them as best as possible when you're no longer here. And hopefully this app gives them the technology, the tools to do that. Sonny, is this something that I should, I should ask you that have not, or is there anything else you want to talk about that we haven't discussed yet? Yes, amazing questions. Really good, really insightful. And uh, I really think that, no, I think, I think that, um, we this has been a great conversation and i really enjoyed talking and exploring these topics with you thanks thanks um can you share your social media for yourself and your company so people can reach out to you sure so the app is called will to click w-i-l-l the number two and click c-l-i-c-k it's available on the app store on twitter i am it's actually called click will to c-l-i-c w-i-l-l and the number two and yeah and any questions on the app, shani at willtoclick.com. And for our listeners, we'll have the link to our social media on the show notes. You can find the show notes at our blog at www.cabinetshlblog.com. Shani, so we'll come to the end of our talk. Can you give us advice and wisdom or anything you want to talk about? Yeah, I make a joke about the never stop learning. You know, that I don't have a tattoo. I see a little bit of yours, Jason. But if I would, it would probably be NSL, Never Stop Learning. The world is in a, got so much adventure in it. Go exploring and enjoy the adventure of it all. Sonny, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jason, for having me. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.